Welcome to episode eight of the Roots of Success podcast. I am your host, Nate the Great Peterman, and today I have a very, very special guest, my man, Nate Rubin. How you doing, brother? Hey, it's a treat. I'm very grateful to be here this morning, Nate. And uh, hello, family. How's everybody doing out there? Hey, man, I appreciate you being on. I know your time's super valuable. And, and yeah, man, I really appreciate you taking the time. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, it's uh, anytime I see a young entrepreneur like yourself doing his best to get a wide variety of guests on a podcast, you know, I was asking myself, what can I do to get on the show? And so I was really grateful when you reached out. Hey, absolutely, brother. You know, it's just the least I can do for sure. And uh, for those of you who might be wondering, like, who's this Nate guy? You know, uh, you know, why should I listen to him and, and everything like that? So I'll give, you know, a quick intro, a little brief background on you, Nate. So Nate Rubin is the founder of Rubin Digital. Nate is 25 years old and is in, in his fourth year of business ownership. As an entrepreneur his whole life, Nate has been working since seven and looking to create opportunities for independent revenue streams ever since high school. Today, Nate is operating around the belief that success is found in first creating his desired lifestyle, then scaling up. Nate is a big believer in physical, mental, emotional and spiritual wellness being the base for a solid and lasting business career. Nate believes giving is the key to growth and always looks for opportunity to create more value for others. Wow, man, that's incredible. <laughs> Thank you. It's, uh, you know, sometimes say I get in an intro is kind of challenging, but that was very good. I really appreciate that one. Absolutely, brother. So, man, I mean, it definitely seems like you have quite the background, of course, just, you know, based off that little intro. And so I guess tell tell the audience and, and of course, tell the viewers, how is it that, you know, you got started, of course, you know, being and, and having your own company? Uh, what got you from, you know, sort of like your lifestyle growing up to where you're at today, man? Sure. I appreciate it. So I'll get really briefly on what it was like growing up, uh, where the big change happened and then like where I got to today. But basically... I grew up two parents, a uh, younger sister, nice house, nice neighborhood, middle class. Like I had every opportunity I needed, but my parents didn't like spoil me with everything I wanted. So it was like a really good balance. And I had a grandpa who owned a car wash. And when I was seven, he started taking me up there on the weekends. I, you know, hustle, vacuum some uh, cars, maybe work two or three hours a time. And then he'd take me home. By the time I'm 10 or 11, I'm working all day. And I'd go in the early shift with my grandpa. Then he'd go home and my uncle would be there and I'd stay with my uncle and he'd take me home. And I remember being like 10 or 11, working all day the day before Christmas. And I came home with 100 bucks cash in my pocket. And so to be young, fourth or fifth grade and have all that money, it was like, you know, you've got to work hard. And, uh, you know, I got to high school. High school, you know, everyone's trying to come up with something funny. I used to sell T-shirts. Uh, I'm Jewish. And so I went to this Jewish summer camp where we had the shirt that said, we Jew what we want. And everybody thought it was hilarious when I got back to school. So I placed an order for like, I don't know, 70. And I just started selling them, you know, as a freshman in high school. The next year it was sweatshirts. Then when the World Cup came out, it was Vuvuzelas. Before you know it, like if there's anything that I feel like people are interested in, exactly, you know, do do. <laughs> I feel like uh, if there's anything people are interested in, I was trying to sell it, and uh, I went away to college and just like totally lost that drive completely because I was like, oh, I just got to kill time for four years while I wait for a degree, and uh, some other stuff happened, which I'll probably get into later, where I end up dropping out, and uh, I came back home and it was like back to square one. I got a job working at a pizza shop, which I got fired from because I couldn't even work the hours they wanted. And then I worked at Chipotle for like 10 months. Then I worked at Tivana for six months. I was doing door to door, pounding doors, trying to get appointments for sales guys for a uh, exterior remodeling company. And then uh, what ended up happening is I got an internship with this company called Swank PR. And I started doing event production. Uh, social media. I did a lot of really cool hands-on stuff in entertainment. And along the way, I just decided I wanted to start a blog. And uh, the funny thing is I never even made that blog. But when I was trying to start that blog, I had to learn how do you build a website? 
what goes into all of that. And in that journey, my father needed a website. So I got my first client right there. He had uh, he had a domain with one company, needed me to move it to another and then build the entire thing. I did it all for like 200 bucks. And I was like, whatever, it's just, you know, something to do. Yeah. And then the company my mom worked for needed a new website. They needed an online marketing manager. They needed this entire, let's get with the program. You know, it's 2014, like let's be online. And so I did that. And a month into that, I said, why don't I just start my own business? And I was doing that on the side. So working 20 hours a week on my business, 20 hours a week at a part-time job, and then working a few other things on the side. A year later, I was like, you know what? I'm ready to go all in on me. I quit all the other jobs. And I think that was June 2015. Ended up bringing on my mom and my sister in 2016. Ended on bringing in a first non-family intern later that year, cycled through a bunch of interns, then finally got a really good one. She's been our third employee and then brought in a good friend of mine to be our fourth employee. And now we've got two or three more interns right now. So it's, it's just been a crazy, crazy grind. Wow, man. No, that's incredible seeing like how it is that you started. It's like you always starting out. It seems like, you've, you know, you've had that like entrepreneurial mindset from the get go. And that's, yeah, man, I definitely have much respect for you there. And I guess a quick question just off of like, you know, a little bit of your background. I know, man, I hear a lot of like mixed reviews, of course, like having like family and, and doing business with family. Right. So, yeah. so what would you say would be maybe the, the biggest challenges or maybe you haven't had any challenges? I don't know. Um, what would you say has been like the biggest obstacle um, or, or like that one thing to sort of like watch out for or to sort of overcome, if you know what I mean. Yeah, totally. So one of the things that I'd say is the biggest challenge is not trying to control the way somebody's living their life outside of what we're doing for work. So early on, when I wanted to bring in my sister as an intern, this was probably five or six months before I actually did, I had problems because I was trying to dictate how I wanted other components of her life to look like in order to deem her to be fit to work for me, which is a really weird thing. You know, it's really just a control issue. And when it was pointed out to me through our lack of success, like, oh, you know what? I'm overstepping my boundaries. Then it became about, okay, what can we do to create really clear work expectations? And then how do we kind of compartmentalize work life and family life? And it doesn't mean treating her like a stranger. You know, I mean, we're, we're a big loving family. We have a lot of fun in the office. But it meant knowing what was my business and what wasn't my business. Okay, I got you. I like I like what you said. Like, don't control their outside life. And I'm sure, like, especially myself, you know, with you and I doing, you know, having our own marketing and, and companies and things like that, it it can be difficult, man. And even myself, like, I just look at and I sometimes think, wow, what if what if I ever had like my mother like work for me here? What if I ever had like you know, because I got a brother. What if my brother worked for me? I think of like just things like that, you know, like whether it's nighttime before I go to sleep, I'd, you know, I'd have thoughts go through my head and things. And it definitely makes me think. And I've always I've always wondered about that. And I'm sure a lot of people like that have their own companies or are looking to start their own companies might be thinking, huh, I wonder if it would be good for me to, to do that, because I've definitely heard a lot of stories where people haven't been as successful and it's really like weighed down like the business. Um, simply because they just couldn't do it with family. And of course, a lot of times whenever that happens, it really can, you know, that relationship can go downhill, especially in, as I'm sure, you know, like relationships are, I mean, that's super crucial, especially with family. You know what I mean? Oh, totally. And I, I think that we had a really unique situation that made us have kind of those roots for success, if you will, mm -hmm. because we had all gone through this seminar company called Pathways for Successful Living. And we had experienced um, an environment that allowed us to be vulnerable with each other. And we had learned how to apply those skills to our lives and effectively communicate our needs. And also, you know, just cut to the core of what's really going on. You know, a lot of people pride themselves on, you know, wanting to be real or be around people who are real. Um, but they don't necessarily know how to tactfully communicate what's really going on. And we had all that. So there was really no issue we couldn't talk about. It was really just being open to listen to each other and get on the same page. Hmm. 
No, absolutely. I totally understand for sure. Um, let me ask you this, Nate. Um, let's let's sort of rewind a little bit, you know, back to like the high school, you know, high school year and, and everything. Um, could you like do you see yourself and, and could you have imagined yourself being where you where you're at right now, you know, being a founder of, of Ruben Digital and, and being in the position you're at right now? Could you could you have pictured that or was that did it just like happen? You know what I mean? Well, so I always pictured running or owning my own business. That was an obvious one. Um, my dad actually told me before I went away to college, he's like, I always expected you to drop out and have this great idea and just be ready to go do it. And I dropped out really without the great idea, which we'll probably get into. But um, I was like always from the beginning, I'm not an employee kind of guy. I can show up and be a really good employee for like two or three months. But then I either get bored of doing the task they hired me for and I want to do more or I'm just like uh, I start to butt heads with I have this growth mindset and they're just trying to maintain and maybe they're not ready to grow as fast as I want to grow. And so it's just never really been a, a, a good thing. I had like 18 or 20 jobs before I started this business. Wow. No, man, that's that's incredible because I look at <laughs> That's so funny, man. Like your story definitely seems very similar to my story. Just like, you know, I, I didn't have like 18 to 20 jobs. I had like probably six or seven anywhere from, of course, McDonald's up to like selling cars. And it's so funny that you said like in that three month span, because that's the thing, man. I feel like, you know, just with jobs and things. And I mean, I definitely respect people that you know have jobs and those that, you know, work hard because they definitely, you know, hustle their butts off to say the least. But Something, you know, I guess just to touch on what you just said, I feel like a lot of bosses and things and like you were saying, you know, you tended to butt heads and I did the same exact thing. Like I just felt that they were too controlling and they mm -hmm. took that so, so serious as if that's their company. But realistically, that's not even their company. You know, like they're still working to work and they're like, I, I hated it, man. Like I just had people and bosses that demanded so much of me. But man, like they couldn't even do some of the tasks that I was assigned to do. Like I used to wear a cash register and I was like, hey, I, f I forget his name, but the one manager, I was like, hey, can, can you help me do this? He didn't even know how to do it. I'm like, bro, how are you my manager? You don't know how to do this. You know, well, it's funny you say that I was maybe 19 or 20 when I worked at Chipotle. Yeah, I was the only one like ever who made margaritas for everybody. Like when somebody came and ordered a margarita, they would ask me, I'm like, first of all, I don't even drink anymore. And you were asking me to go and make the margaritas and I'm not even 21. Like legally I shouldn't be doing this. Um, it was just, it was funny. Oh, absolutely, man. Um, so what would you say, you know, I know, you know, uh, you said like, you know, dropping out of school and everything. Um, what, what would you say was that thing that really made you want to do that? Cause of course, as I'm sure you and I both know, like the educational system, fortunately, it's not where it could be. You know, there's a lot of messed up things and just yeah. with, with values and things, things could for sure be changed and, and be different. I'm sure if, if you and I ran it, you know. So so what would you say is that one thing that was just I just told you, Nate, I mean, this isn't this isn't you, man. You got to get out of here. What, what was that one thing? Um, I mean, in all honesty, it was that. My big, which is my biggest criticism of college. First, let me, let me step back for a second. I think college is great. If you are very clear on what you want to do, you know, I'm looking for this job. I'm looking for this career. And it says I need to do boom, boom, boom. And then I can get my foot in the door. I think people who are dedicated and motivated, have a dream and a vision, go to college. You know, if it's going to get you there. For me, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I ended up going to the school engineering down at Clemson in South Carolina. I had a blast, but I was just there because I thought it was what I was supposed to do, not what I wanted. And my biggest criticism of college is we take a bunch of people, 18 to 24, or maybe even older because of military or whatever, who are trying to figure out who they are in the world. This is who I was trying to figure out my place, throw them all together and let's see what kind of habits they develop. And everything good about my life, I pretty much threw away. Like I ate really healthy. I used to work out. I used to be very like family oriented, very much staying in communication with people. I got to college, all those habits disappeared. 
I didn't want to make time for Skype calls. Didn't want to go to the gym. I didn't want to, stu- well, I never studied anyway, but I didn't want to study. Uh, all of those things like went out the window and I ended up developing, you know, a pretty bad drug habit, alcohol problem. And I'm around people who are going through the same thing. And I watch what in regular society would be deemed like total unacceptable behavior just become like cool because it's college, you know, like uh, there's a Kanye West song or one of his skits, I think on late registration, where he talks about that drug habit you pick up when you're at school. And it's not a joke. Like I, I've never met anyone who grows up and says, I want to be a cokehead, but I've met people who are like, oh, well, it's college. And then all of a sudden, you know, they get out of college and they've got a nasty coke problem. No, absolutely, man. And it's funny. I mean, some of the people that I know and, you know, that I graduated with and of course, like with Penn State, you know, here in Pennsylvania being a huge college and one of the top party schools in the nation. It's just crazy, man. Like a lot of people, they go to college and I like to have the conversation like, why are you going to college? Like, are you really majoring what you want to major? And they're just like, no, nah, man, I'm going to party. I'm going to I'm going to chillax. I'm going to, you know, smoke some weed or something like that. Exactly. And I mean, it's like, oh, OK, um, I got you. So like, what's your plan? <laughs> and they're just like, I don't know, man, I'm just going to chillax. There's this one guy that told me that. And I'm just thinking, good Lord. I mean, I mean, I, I care for the dude like he's he's dope. I mean, definitely care what he you know does. And I try to give him advice. But it's like it's like, man, I feel like just a lot of people got it twisted nowadays. And just I don't know, man, there's just so many mixed reviews on that. And I definitely think like, of course, I didn't realize that about you, like your story um how that happened and and things so i guess for you like you know with with you said you know you, you being uh involved with drugs and having some usage in that and of course like drinking what would you recommend somebody let's say you know i'm somebody that or i'm listening right now and i'm someone that sort of has that issue what would sure. you say that i need to do or, or where would you say i would need to go and and i want to fix that what would you say that I do yeah i mean I guess it depends because there's a lot of people I actually go and I speak to high schools now and I speak to young people in health class about this very thing. Um, You don't have a problem until you have a problem. Like there are so many people who could fit into a category that I would say you're a drug addict or you're an alcoholic or you're a problem drinker or whatever. But unless it resonates to them and they don't like the way they feel or they have a problem with their lifestyle, they're not motivated to do anything. And so like the way I would use drugs or alcohol could look totally different than you. But if we had the same feelings inside and we both were trying to escape or whatever, um, then we could still relate on a common solution. And what's funny like that, I didn't, I didn't even get into yet, but the re- the real reason why I left college, yeah. I got, I had a bad mushroom trip one night and I assaulted two police officers. Whoa. And yeah. I don't even really totally remember what happened because I had been drinking a little. I'd been smoking some weed and it just kind of went in like a rage blackout. And I do remember coming to in the hospital with one hand cuffed back here and one hand cuffed all the way down here and uh, being just strapped into this bed. And they're like, you know, telling me what happened. And like, well, officer, I was on drugs. Like, I wouldn't have done that normally. Why don't you just let me go? And he's like, look, bro, I don't care you hit a cop, you bit me, you're going to jail. <laughs> and so I had to just like cool out for an hour so they could see I was cool. Like health wise, I was fine. I wasn't going to attack them. And then they brought me to jail and I uh, spent the night. I mean, it was, it was not like a, a big deal in terms of like, I'm, I'm not like I've survived like Cook County or anything, but it was, you know, just a private cell, but waking up in the morning, talking face to face to a judge, seeing two felonies on paper $20,000 worth of bond, something hit me like, oh, maybe it's not just a series of bad decisions. Maybe I have a problem. And that was like the catalyst for wanting to go get help, moving back home and just totally changing my life. Wow, man, that's not, that's, that's crazy, bro. Um, tell me this is, is, uh, is, is, I know you were in, in, you know, the, you, you spent the night in, in like the, the, the private cell in jail. And of course, like you said, like with going to the judge, is is it just like they, they show on TV or is it a little bit more, uh, is, it, is it not as nice? <laughs> so what I think what they don't get you in TV is like, I've always slept with a blanket. 
Uh, I just like, I feel warm. Like, you know, I like to wrap under my toes, curl up, no blankets in jail. And so, you know, I'm at least in a holding cell. So I'm laying on my arms, I'm cold. And, uh, you know, that, that was probably the one thing that stands out to this day is just like how totally unable to take care of my basic needs in that moment I was and realizing I didn't want to, you know, go live like that for 10 years. Absolutely. So what would you say was that moment? Um, I know you said, I'm sure after, you know, getting out and everything, but what would you say was that moment where you're just like, man, Nate, like it's now or never, you know, I, I ain't doing this again. I ain't going back, you know? I get it. I, um, so I moved back home and I had, you know, like three or four months where I just tried to do it myself. And um, at one point I went to that pathway seminar I was telling you about, they have like a series of three seminars. So I went to the first seminar, realized the way I was living life was a problem. Went to the second seminar, realized some really specific behavioral things and relationships I needed to change. And I just got more honest about my problems or my faults or my weaknesses than I ever was. And it was crazy. And then when I started the leadership training, which is their third seminar, I remember I had felt really bad for myself one night. I was, you know, all wrapped up in self-pity and I end up going out, hanging out with people I know I shouldn't and getting high uh, like two days after I had taken a drug test for court. And, you know, I let everyone talk me in like, oh, they're not going to test you again for a while. You'll be fine. And then I go back to Pathways and I talk about this. They're like, but what if they do? And they're like, why would you do that anyway? And so I had this point where I sat in the hallway and I thought, why would I do that? Well, there's only two reasons. Either one, I feel like I need drugs to socialize and to relate to people, which I don't because I've just spent six months pretty much totally drug free and alcohol free. Um, or I'm an addict and I've just got this itch I need to scratch. And sometimes I'm going to do something stupid and scratch that itch. And it was like, oh, wow, I, I am an addict. I am an alcoholic. I need to do something about this. And from that day on, uh, it was like, OK, it's it's time to really get serious about this. Absolutely. And I think it's amazing that you did identify that because, man, I'm sure, you know, people. And of course, I know people and I'm sure the viewers in the audience, you know, I'm sure they know a lot of people as well that they're just a victim to that. And they can't break that habit like with drugs, with, you know, drinking and, and things like that. And it's it's a very serious issue because. It's just it's insane because it's 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 an addiction and and people they just can't break out of it it seems and it's sad because even some like family members, um you know of, of people's families I mean it's it's sad to see because people go downhill and and you want the best for them you you know that they they can do great things in the world you know that they work hard but it, it just they can't break it and it's not easy I mean myself I can't relate because I've never you know, done any, any of those things, but looking at you, man, I mean, you're like a living testimony, you know, I mean, you pretty much like, you were like at the bottom, you, you I mean, you went to, bro, you went to prison, you know, for a night, you had to go in front of a judge, like, I see that on TV, I, I ain't never imagined myself doing that, like, if I did that, man, the Lord can come down and do something to me, like, I give him the right, you feel me, but it's like, I just can't imagine that, man, and you're just, I definitely got a lot of respect for you, bro, because a lot of people, they can't break that, you know, and they definitely they need help. And no, I mean, I really appreciate you sharing that for real. Oh, thank you. I mean, that's because you, you had asked earlier about, like, what does someone do to get help? Yeah. And that's one of those things is like if anyone is going to want to really understand how I could offer them my suggestions for help, they need to know where I've been and they need to know what I like, how I can relate. And then they're either going to value my experience or they won't. Um, but that's, you know, I, my experience was like court helped me get my shit together where not everybody has that luxury. I watch people struggle who I would look at, you know, with a clear and sober mind now and say, check mark, check mark, check mark. You've got all these symptoms of like the stuff's ruining your life, but you haven't had a serious enough consequence. So like that, I'm super grateful for that because that laid the foundation for me to really build the lifestyle I wanted. Mm, absolutely. And I'm glad you, you know, sort of said about building the lifestyle is, you know, that is the topic, uh, you know, for today's episode is building that lifestyle that you want. So I guess, you know, sort of getting into that now, Nate, 
Um, I'm, I know you have habits. I, I tuned in, and if, if if you if you don't follow Nate, I would definitely do so for sure on on LinkedIn as being one of the platforms. And uh, I'll, I'll give like the, the the social media handles at the end of the episode. But I'm seeing that you do this. It's called Meditation March, correct? Yeah. And uh, I've been watching. I, I went through some of those videos and everything. You know, a couple of days prior. And, and man, I definitely I, I love the videos and I love what it is that you're doing there. So, man, tell us about this, you know, the meditation march. Like, you know, why, why are you doing it? And maybe just some some of your habits in general, of course, the building that, you know, lifestyle, that dream lifestyle. Sure. So I would say very specifically why I'm doing meditation march comes down to total transparency, business motivation followed by a desire for a true personal branding. So anyone who's paying attention to social knows LinkedIn is popping right now. There are video influencers creating mega reputations, what seems like overnight. I mean, nothing is really ever overnight. In my opinion, you have to do the work to show up. And once you pop, if you've really been doing the work, you're going to just keep working harder. So that, that's why some people take off after stardom and some people fail. But I watched all this. And I thought, what do I want to be known for? And what do I think I can contribute that's unique? Because quite frankly, there's enough people talking about the latest and greatest in marketing. I, I don't need to try and be, you know, the next Gary Vee or Grant Cardone or, or Tim Ferriss, whoever you're into, you know, I don't need to be that guy. I need to be Nate Rubin. Mm -hmm. And what I was struggling with was consistency and some of those habits that I've built over the past five years. And a lack of a daily grounding meditation was the obvious low-hanging fruit. It just happened to be March. And meditate, meditation March just sounded like a good idea. So I said, why don't I use March to hold myself accountable to the world, show them what I'm working towards, and then on a daily basis, I'll just talk about whatever I'm feeling that day that can relate to my audience and provide real value. Wow, absolutely. A lot of people, they look at March as, March Madness, you know, NCAA basketball and, and things, but having that mentality, meditation march, I, I love it, man. So, like, I guess for, for meditation, because, you know, I, I do meditation and, and things. I haven't really been too big on it until a couple months ago. I actually, yeah, I got it right here, actually. I got this thing. It, it's called Muse, and basically, um, I guess you can say I'm plugging them right now, but it's this thing, you know, you put on, like, your forehead, and as you can see, if, if, if you're watching the video for the viewers, it actually reads like your brain waves. So like you simply, you know, you put it over like your ears, it connects like that. And then you, you turn on from the side and it actually reads like your brain waves and everything. And it's really cool because wow. I'm, I'm the type where I can't just meditate without having some like accountability. Like I'm really big into accountability. Right. And, and that's something that helps me. So maybe for you, Nate, like, Let's say, man, I want to I want to meditate more. I want to get into meditation. You know, Nate and, and, and Nate and Nate, they're saying about meditation. Right. So, yeah. like, how would you recommend somebody starts and what would you say that they have to do to eliminate some of the like the distractions? Because we have a lot that go through our heads, as I'm sure, you know, and whatnot. But how, how would you sort of you know elaborate on that? Sure. Uh, I think first I'm going to start by giving people the best meditation technique I've ever received. Best advice ever. You guys ready? Yep. Step one, sit comfortably and close your eyes. Got it. That's it. <laughs> you know, it's really that simple because this is what that exercise taught me. Just the act of closing your eyes it's going to reduce the number of thoughts you're having by 50%. And the biggest challenge people face is um, feeling like they're doing it right. And so in that, what felt like an eternity, the first time that tip was given to me, really like four or five seconds, the amount of peace and in the moment I got just by anticipating what's the next direction and listening with my full attention, that's like a micro of what we're trying to achieve through meditation. And when you realize it's all about finding those moments of stillness, and it's not about necessarily the whole 30 minutes of stillness, that's when things start to click for me. And so to eliminate distractions, 
there's, there's a lot of good things. One would be find a time every day that you know you could be away from everybody. So a lot of people are into uh, like 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. or 6 a.m. and 12 midnight, depending on how much time they sleep. Um, some people have it just scheduled randomly. Myself, I have meditation scheduled um, when I wake up, uh, depending on how I'm physically feeling. Do I go do something to engage and wake up my body for about 10 or 15 minutes and then go meditate? Or do I just roll out of bed and start right away? And, um, and a big thing for me is also what are we trying to achieve? And it's weird because like a lot of meditation is not about achieving anything. Right. But I have uh, there's different schools where I've gone to where they teach different breathing techniques versus different types of guided visualizations Versus there's like the seven layers of self meditation journey that gets me to this most inner place. Um, so it, it really, you know, what type of practice is someone trying to create and why? And then, you know, going and learning from different schools, reading books, finding personalities online. For sure. So what would you say? Because, um, of course, like everybody has, you know, a different schedule in, in their yeah. daily lives. What would you say is the most effective? for you personally, um, time wise during the day, would you say like morning, afternoon or, or night, or maybe it, maybe it doesn't matter for me morning okay. because it's once that I've done and I can say, I know I did it. And the technique that I actually do in the mornings is uh, a combination of probably like four or five. But the, the main thing is a breathing, like a cleansing breath, which is uh, a Kriya and it's designed to get your energy flowing properly and to kind of clean out some of the baggage that we don't need and just get super aligned and focused. And it's based on the concept that there's like four things we need for healthy survival, you know, having food, having water, having shelter, and then having air, prana, life force. And I found that when I'm doing this technique every single day to start my day, I have more energy. I'm not quite as hungry. I can stay up later and I'm super focused in the words and everything just comes naturally to me. So when I make that the foundation of the morning, any other meditation throughout the day is a bonus. You know, if it's, if it's loud inside my head, I can go, you know, find some silence or stillness for a little bit. Um, but yeah, I, I, for me, mornings, definitely. Man, not for sure. Um, and I'm sure there may be like some links online, uh, like with Kriya and, and some of these other things that you were going over for people to like, maybe look at if somebody is interested? Yeah. Um, is there a section for us to list links afterwards or would you want me to just say them now? Absolutely. Yeah, I'll probably just put them in like the bio or description. Cool. Yeah. Some of the, like just some of the organizations I've worked with that have taught me, yeah. one is called the Art of Living Foundation. And sure. there's actually a really cool center that's probably a few hours from you. Um, I studied with uh, Shivananda Yoga. I've studied over at a, a group called Ananda. And then I've gone from just like event to event and just seeing what's going on. And so I, I've really gotten a, a privilege of taking techniques from multiple lines of worship, which is really funny because, you know, I, I grew up, uh, you know, a Jew on the North Shore of Chicago around a much different lifestyle, uh, you know, of spirituality and religion. And my family, for whatever reason, has been drawn to learning from a lot of Buddhists and Hindus. And uh, it's just it's been really eye opening and totally changed the way I see the world. Wow, man. No, I'm sure. Man, that's incredible. Um, I've always got a big kick out of meditation and, and just like, the, you know, the different ways, because, I mean, there isn't just one way, you know. But of course, it, it definitely comes, like you said, as simple as sit comfortably and, and close your eyes, you know. And uh, no, nah, man, that's that's amazing. So. I guess, uh, yeah, I'll definitely I'll put the, the, the links and everything in the in the, in the description and the bio and, and things. So I guess one last thing on the topic of like, you know, building your, your dream lifestyle. What would you say, Nate, is has been one of the most important, one of the major keys, as DJ Khaled likes to say, what would you say has been like that one key for you to, to building that lifestyle that you want? Of course, meditation, uh, you know, I'm sure has uh, gone into that. But what would you say, you know, starting today, somebody needs to do, you know, I need that one thing, whether it's a habit, you know, whether it's that one thing that I can just do that can simply improve my life to getting me closer. Not not there, because, of course, it's a process. 
You can't just go from point A to point B just like that. You know, there's levels to it. There's a process, as you know that. But what would you say? Maybe something that you've done, whether it's a technique, maybe it's reading more books, maybe it's watching more videos, or just something out of the ordinary is that thing that you would recommend somebody starts today to getting to that dream lifestyle? Sure. I'd say there's one obvious thing to me. It's a combination of conceptual and practical, and it's developing a habit of self-inventory. And it's one of the gifts I received through you know, recovery, but there are people who live this lifestyle without ever having to recover from any kind of you know, behavior. What I mean by self-inventory is learning how on pen and paper to look at myself and look at everything on, you know, what people would say, the positives, everything on the negatives, and then really dive deeper into what motivates me. What are some of my character defects? What are the things that drive me? What are, what are the, the forces really that create the motivation for me to take action? And, and that self-analysis, that self-survey gave me a really good understanding of who I am. And then asking other people for feedback. Like, you know, yeah. do you see these things in me? Uh, you know, can you list my greatest strengths? Can you list my greatest areas to improve? And once I had that list, it's like, okay, Nate Rubin, this is how you've been behaving, how you've been operating and the way you think. Are you willing to do something about it? And then that's how I create a different lifestyle. Because if I, and if I don't know what needs to change, I'm not really going to be effective at changing. I could watch a, a million videos. I could read a million books. But if I have no clue who I am, how do I know what I need to apply to my life and what is a valuable asset? And then, I mean, I know you said one thing, but like that's right. like the framework for then creating and projecting what an ideal life looks like. So once you've done a personal inventory, the greatest tool I've ever found for non-spiritual work, but just life work is having a time inventory. So what does my time look like? You know, first writing out what does a day look like for me? What does a week look like for me? I have all these goals I say I want to achieve. Where is that time going to come from? And then budgeting for all those things. So I start with a list at the top, 168 hours, because that's how long everybody has in a week. And what do I need to do? I need to sleep. I probably average seven hours of sleep. So I'd write like seven times seven, 49. I'd subtract that. And then I'd go and let's say, let's do the math together. I'll just pull out a calculator so we can do this entire journey together. Because mm -hmm. this is, I feel like, one of the greatest gifts I ever got. Mm -hmm. So you take that 168 and you minus 49. Now we're at 119. So then what else do I need to do? Uh, I probably need to eat. I spend maybe two hours a day eating. Two times uh, seven, that's 14. So we're going to subtract 14. Now we're at 105 hours left in my week. I've got 105 hours now. What else do I need? Well, I mentioned to you that I'm a recovering drug addict and alcoholic. So I go to different types of 12-step meetings. So at one point, that looked like going to seven meetings a week. And it's about an hour and a half commitment, you know, an hour for the meeting, maybe 15 minutes to get there, 15 minutes to leave. So What's seven times uh, one and a half? I think that's 10 and a half. So I'm going to subtract that. Now we're at 94 and a half. And then I was like, okay, well, I want to work out. I want to be healthy. So let's say I'm working out uh, three times a week for two hours. So that's in six hours. So let's drop six from there. Now we're at 88 and a half. Okay, well, what do I do on a daily basis? Meditation. If I want to do my 30 minute meditation every morning and maybe I want to do 20 minutes or 30 minutes of reading every night, let's just call it an hour of personal development. So let's take another seven out of our week. Now we're at 81 and a half. It's like, OK, there's more than half our week gone in just doing the basics to survive. Now, what do I want to do for fun? Uh, I mentioned those, you know, I meet people at meetings and recovery. Maybe I want to go out once or twice a week for three hours. So let's call that another six hours gone. Okay, now I'm at 75 and a half. I got to work, right? Yep. Um, so let's say I have a 40 hour a week job. I'm a, I'm a salaried employee somewhere. And a lot of those people are actually working more than 40 hours. Well, let's take 40 out of there. Now I'm at 35 and a half. 
okay, I've got this much time. Uh, maybe I want to see family once a week for five hours. Now I'm at 30 and a half. And so you see, you get a pattern and it's like now if I'm also taking classes on the side, maybe I spend 10 hours a week total at school and doing homework. All right, I'm at 20 and a half hours. And you look at 20 and a half hours for the rest of the week to have a girlfriend or have other friends that you see to go play basketball, to go to the movies, to watch TV, whatever it is you want to do. And this activities and when you can see the lifestyle you want and you can budget for the time when it doesn't go to plan now you know where it's going and that's how I became serious about saying this habit needs to go this person needs to go uh, this is what gets to stay and it becomes a, a process that gets perfected over years wow oh, man no that's that's incredible just the way that you broke that down I mean that definitely even myself like I like that's something to implement into my, you know, everyday life, everyday, everyday life. And that's something that I feel like a lot of people, if they implement just the time structure, because mm -hmm. goodness, man, I mean, there's so many times and you know, there's so many distractions in a day that happens, especially with social media. You know, I mean, wherever they're scrolling and, and oh man, they're, I got a, I got a, you know, a, like a, like a DM or something that comes through. And I'm just like, I got to get to that soon, you know, like yeah. and time thing. And, and of course, like, honest feedback because family i mean family's great but at the end of the day like they're they're not always willing to give you honest feedback look at you know american idol for example you got people that go on there they're over there singing they think man i'm the best singer in the world i'm the next michael jackson i'm, I'm the next alicia keys or something like that and then you find out it's like man who, who told you you're good at singing oh yeah my mom yeah my mom said i was so good at singing and it's like Man, I think they were just being a little bit nice. You might want to, you might want to get some, you know, honest feedback from strangers. You know. <laughs> oh, totally. Oh, totally. I think, I think when I talked about, when I talked about, and I'm getting a little feedback here. I apologize, but when I talked about what's your focus of meditation, why do you do it? Some people just want all of the scientific effects, which is really cool. You know, if meditation for science is all you want, go for it. I needed a deeper soul solution. And so what meditation has helped me see, positive, negative is not a thing. It's just two sides of a coin. The reality is there's only one. And when I could adopt that, it's no longer about what's good and what's bad. It's what's working and what isn't working. Because who I am, who you are, who we all are as people, fundamentally, we're perfect. We're out here learning. And we're out here trying to become, whether it's a better human being, if you're you know, a believer in Christ and you're, how can I be the best Christian I can? And how can I spread the word? You know, how can I be the light? Uh, whatever your uh, spiritual connection, you know, whatever you think purpose is, you're just out here trying to live that out. Like I really buy into karma. I buy into the idea that like I'm out here working out whatever something happened in a past life and I'm trying to do better. Um, you know, we're talking about being big, uh, big Sean fans, yeah. you know, he, at the end of one of his albums, he's talking about, um, I think it's a song bigger than me. He's talking about with his mom, how, like, um, I feel like somebody who, uh, just tried and failed. And now I've been woken up and given the second chance at life. And I feel like I walk around like that every day. And when you know that, and you know, just how special it is to be here. Like, I would love to confront my things that aren't working anymore because then I could do something about that. Whereas I think most people just want to hide and pretend they don't exist. And then they rob themselves the opportunity to get better. No, nah, man, that's that's so true. They definitely. Yeah. I mean, every 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 word you're saying, bro, it's it's that's literally what I've sort of been playing in my head. And I just wish I wish everybody had that mindset. Because, man, if everybody had that mindset, oh, we'd be the greatest planet on the earth. You know, <laughs> no, we'd be the greatest planet ever. You know? But no, I mean, it's it's definitely incredible. And and uh, yeah, and I know we're sort of on a time crunch and everything, Nate. Uh, I sort of want to transition and, and everything. I do this little fun segment 
uh, it's it's a question from one to fifty. Uh, I'll ask you like three random questions. You're gonna pick uh, randomly uh, the number, and it can be questions revolving around like something deep, like you know within your business, or it could be something as like you know what's your favorite food or something like that. You know, just sort of adding that little twist to it. So um, we'll start off with like your first number. So what number from one to fifty would you like to start off with? Twenty nine. Twenty nine. All right, Nate, what was your most embarrassing moments in your life? Wow. Um, besides the, you know, embarrassment that came with my initial, like, going through all my jail stuff, um, more embarrassing, I would have to say, was when I was younger. And um, I had... Uh, I had liked this girl. I was probably in like fourth or fifth grade. And uh, I asked her to be my girlfriend. And she ended up being like, you know, she wasn't interested is basically what it was. And uh, young people aren't always good at, you know, stopping somebody and saying, you know what, I'm just not interested. Keep it moving. And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of rejection today because it saves us time. But she basically gave me this BS excuse. Right. And then a year later, I found out she was dating this guy that I knew from camp. And uh, and when he and I were talking about like, oh, I used to know her. And he's like, yeah, she said you uh, wanted to be her boyfriend. Is It's funny that you thought you would even be able to get a girl like her. I was like, oh, wow, like this is what you think of me. And like that was probably the most crushing thing I can remember. Um, but like, it, I don't know, it sounds kind of like surface, but uh, I've gone through so much of depth that like, really uh just romantic embarrassment is probably the most embarrassing thing no nah, for sure man i mean yeah I've, I've went through mine as well and i think that's part of life you know it's, it's definitely great like that rejection for sure because it saves a lot of time no doubt um all right what's your your second option 35 35 oh this is this is perfect what background uh slash ethnicity are you so I always like to ask people, what do you think I am? Because I get a lot of like questions. Um, when I tell people I'm a mixed uh, Eastern European like mutt, you know, I uh, I really identify more as a Jew than anything. So yeah. like I've got ancestors from Russia, from Poland, from Hungary. Um, I get a lot of questions. When I go to Israel, my skin gets like three or four shades darker. And I just feel a real connection to the land there. And it's like, I'm a big believer, you know, we all come from Africa. And so at different points, where did our ancestors deviate and migrate and adopt a new climate? Um, About fourth, fifth generation American. So I'm not really sure if that answers your question. But those are the things that come to mind when I think about that. Yeah, for sure. You've been to Israel, you said? Yeah, I went twice. I, I had the privilege of going with my father um, between sixth and seventh grade, we went there for three weeks and then, and we really just did it. The only time we had a tour was in the desert. Everything else was just me and him in a map and figuring it out. And, uh, yeah, it was incredible. And then I went when I was 20 on a, a birthright trip, which for those of you who don't know a birthright, um, any Jew from 18 to 26 who wants to go to Israel to experience it on a group led tour can go for basically free. Man, so what's it like in the desert, man? I, I mean, I've read stories about it, but was it like they'd say, or how is it? The desert is one of my favorite places in the world, actually. Um, and the reason, first, as a kid, I just liked it hot. I liked being out in the sun. I liked, you know, I do very well in a warm climate. But spiritually, I was maybe 10 months sober when I went on that birthright trip. And that was actually the last time I ever used drugs was on the plane ride there. And I, I took some Xanax that wasn't prescribed to me. Basically, long story short, this guy pulls out a bottle of Jack and he's like, you guys want to get fucked up. And I just want nothing to do with that moment at all. I'm like, get me out of here. And so my friend is like, do you want to take some Xanax? Or he says, or is that against like your sobriety thing? And my first thought was like, I shouldn't do it. You know, I'm 10 months sober. I know this isn't prescribed to me. This would be a relapse. But then my second thought was, fuck it. And I just did it. And I learned the two most dangerous words in my life. And that going like four days, 
of not really being like truly sober anymore, not having my meetings, not having my support system. I started like spazzing on people, just like bad reactions, being very angry, returning to all those old habits. And my best friend's with me. He's like, bro, do you need a meeting? And I'm like, yeah, I do. And we're in the desert for the weekend, um, you know, having Shabbat, which is, you know, Friday night, Saturday, no electronics, just like chilling, being in the moment. And I think he's going to grab like five or six guys and we're going to have a meeting. He goes and tells the guy who's running the whole trip. And we end up having a meeting with 50 people. And I'm the only one who's ever been at a meeting of like Alcoholics Anonymous or NA or anything like that. And I'm leading this meeting full of people who've never been. And it turned into this open and vulnerable thing where this kid is talking about how he wants to kill himself. And he's got a notebook full of suicide notes. And this girl's talking about how both her parents just died. And all these people got so vulnerable and so real in a way that the, the trip leaders had never seen before. And so like my desert experience was about self-reflection and self-inventory and, and sharing in that community. And I ended up staying up all night that night uh, to watch the sunrise or the sunrise in the morning. But I had some deep conversations with people. I actually did another Kriya that day so it could give me the rest of the energy to keep going. And um, so whenever I think of the desert, I just think about where I found that, you know, God never leaves me and he puts me around the people I need. And whenever I ask for help, somebody will show up. And so when I think the desert, I just think me and God and his world, and that's it. Ways you never know what's going to happen and what's going to come up. Yeah, for sure. Like that's that's incredible. Just the death. I mean, shoot, man. I, I definitely I want to go to the desert and man. If I have an experience like that, <laughs> I can definitely you know see that holds you know a sacred place in your heart for sure. Like, man, that's incredible. Um, and then yeah, the last question, brother. All right, let's see. Uh, let's go sixteen. Okay. How did you learn to embrace failure? Mm, it's a good one. Yeah. Um, so one of the meetings that I used to go to has a sign on the wall. And it said that it may be that our only purpose in life is to serve as a warning to others. And when I read that, first, I felt like the biggest piece of shit ever. Because I was like, oh, I've officially become that guy who like, people can point to and say, I don't want to be like him. And, uh, and it stung because I was in that process of inventory and realizing who I was. But eventually I started to learn that these failures um, were my greatest um, successes or opportunities for success because that's where the learning happens. And that's where the growth and the change happens. When people are winning, like if I were to do something and it's going well, I would never sit and reflect and say, hmm, you know, what can I learn from this? I would just learn that I'm great, I'm awesome, and I'm going to keep it moving. Um, but when I fail, there's the opportunity to figure out what isn't working. And if I've come this far doing great with everything that is working, and now I've identified something that isn't, that just means it's going to propel me to that next level of greatness when I can address it and deal with it. And so I'll, I'll try and be specific. I had a big failure in work where um, actually this week where a client did not like the writing that we did for them. And where I failed is we didn't have a better system in place for taking notes during our initial meeting. Our notes were very scattered, but I worked with my business coach and I came up with a great new formula for my note taking. Um, I didn't give my employee proper direction for, okay, we're going to start here. We're going to do this and we're going to do it within this framework. Um, I'm a very hands-off manager and I learned that this was the kind of project that needed to be more hands-on. And then I learned that the way I dealt with the client wasn't to their liking and I learned what to avoid in future communications. And so in that moment, like while it was happening, I felt really bad because I was like, oh, you know what? We didn't deliver what they wanted. But immediately after that, it was I just was given the gift 
of showing a process that is not working in my business. And this person is literally paying me to figure out how to improve that process. And when I could take out the good versus bad and just the this isn't working and this is how we get to what is working, I embrace failure and I look for failure so then I can address the failure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Failure, even myself personally, that's been one of the biggest keys to my success. And I feel like a lot of people get it twisted. They feel like failing is bad. And that's that's where you definitely learn, learn the most. And that's one of the secret keys to success, you know, failing. And uh, just like Big Sean says, I, I forget how he says it, but he's like, last night took an L, but tonight I bounced back, you know? <laughs> it's funny. That was always my dad's line to me. Not not like Big Sean, obviously, but he Ooh. said, uh, how big is your bounce going to be? Ooh. You know, when you hit that bottom, how high are you going to propel from that? It's like a, a bouncy ball. It's got some weird like cheat codes in the way it manipulates physics because when you drop something, usually with the effect of gravity coming back up, it's not going to be perfect. But you throw that bouncy ball at the ground and it woo, it takes off. <laughs> and so it's like how big is your bounce going to be? Some people go a little overboard with the failure and they go and they set out to fail. Yeah. I don't buy that concept because if you have something on paper that you know is going to fail – you just don't do it that way. You figure out who do I need to talk to to learn how to do this differently. But if you set out to succeed and you're failing along the way, that's going to drive you to more success because you're not even looking as failure being the long-term situation. It's just a stop in the journey. Straight up, brother. Straight up, man. You've been dropping some nuggets on here today. Uh, for the viewers and the listeners, man, if you're not taking notes, you got to re-listen to this because I'm telling you, man, Nate, he's one of a kind, as you can see. And yeah, I definitely appreciate that. So as we sort of wrap this up, Nate, um, what's one thing? Maybe you've already addressed it, but just real quick, what's that, you know, what's one thing that you would like to leave the audience with for them to to apply into their lives? Besides all the specific tools I've given you, if there was one conceptual thing I would want to leave you with, one piece of wisdom or one hope. Really, because I, I, I'm not, who am I to tell you how to live your life? Um, my hope is that you commit to spending time with yourself to find out who and what you are and then journey out on who you could become and what you want to ultimately live like. Because nobody is going to show up one day and just magically tell you exactly who you are and give you the game plan for what you need to do to get to where you want to go. There's a lot of incredible people along for the ride on this journey to just help you get where you want to go. But if you don't know yourself well enough to even know your values and why you want to do what you want to do and where you want to be, you're never going to get there. It's not going to just magically happen. Straight up, bro. No, man, I appreciate that. Commit to spending time with yourself. If you don't know yourself, it's tough to it's tough to get to success, to say the least. And I'm sure, you know, you and I, we've been through it. And yeah, man. So, yeah, Nate, I definitely appreciate you being on today, brother. It really means a lot. Uh, before we end this, where, you know, can the, the audience, where can the viewers find you? What's your website? Uh, what's your social handles? I'll let you plug those in, my brother. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, first off, you can find our business at Ruben, R-U-B-E-N, digital. It's down there, rubendigital.com. Uh, my social media handles personally, at Nate Ruben RDM. We recently just dropped media from our names, but I haven't, you know, changed my personal handle. Uh, Ruben Digital, CHI or SHA, because I'm from Chicago. Um, that is where you can find us on Instagram, on Twitter. We're all on Facebook personally. But right now, if you really want to know what I'm doing, you should hit me up on LinkedIn. Because LinkedIn, I, just, I vibe with LinkedIn because there's something about it's going through this metamorphosis of it's no longer just a resume place. It's no longer just a place to get hired, but it's a place for business-minded growth individuals to collaborate and network and forge meaningful relationships, which can be done on all those other platforms. But then you also have to deal with distractions like you know Instagram models selling ass all day. Like You have to be really good at filtering what you will click like on so that way you do not give away your brain space and LinkedIn, I feel like, just cuts the clutter out perfectly for me. 
Absolutely. I know I'm definitely going to be uh, using LinkedIn more, especially after watching the, the meditation March you know, video series that you got going on. So guys, give my guy Nate Rubin a follow. As you can see, this he's, he's like no other, to say the least. He provides so much value. And uh, Nate, I really appreciate you being on the show, brother. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Nate. Uh, much love to you and everybody else out there. Have a great day. I appreciate you, homie.